Today I'd like to talk about anti-Semitism and its relationship to racism, especially imperial racism in 19th century Europe. Now, when we think of anti-Semitism, that is um, Jewish hate, um, that is hate of those who are Jewish, we usually turn to Germany only because we know of Nazi Germany and the Holocaust. However, this is not the entire story and it would be wrong to assume that we should look only at Germany. In fact, in the 19th century, it was France that seemed to host this pernicious ideology. And it is France in which anti-Semitism became a popular and political platform, which culminated in the infamous Dreyfus Affair, which is what I will talk about today. But first, let's define anti-Semitism. This is actually a rather recent term that came into full public use in the late 19th century. It was coined in 1865 by a German thinker to distinguish it from anti-Judaism. And it became the name of a political movement founded and organized around group prejudice against Jews and that used pseudo-scientific theory of race as its justification, theories that became especially prevalent in the wake of the 1871 Franco-Prussian War. Now, in terms of how we think of anti-Semitism, um, for centuries, um, there had been expressions of anti-Jewish thought and prejudice um, ever since the Middle Ages um, rooted in the Christian religion. So Jews in Europe were a religious minority who had been subject to discrimination, restrictions and segregation, who had been restricted in the professions they could exercise, restricted in where they could live, restricted in their places of worship, and did not have full political and civic rights. Last week's lecture showed you how that was the case for Russia in the Pearl of Settlement. Now, things look slightly different in Western Europe. Now, in the 19th century, the question of what we call emancipation becomes a central one for European states, especially as nation states harness the power of nationalism in order to bind its people to a vision of the nation. Now remember, this is always in the context of empire and the ways in which racism and imperial racism shapes how Europeans see themselves and see the world. So what is emancipation? The act of emancipation, as we call it, is the act of setting free from legal, political, and social restraints. And this posed a set of questions for Jews and those who were not Jewish, that is, who were Gentiles. States and rulers asked themselves, should emancipation be gradual or should states grant Jews full political rights at once? And remember, this echoes many of the discussions on slavery and abolition. There were other questions. Does emancipation require assimilation and the demand that Jews embrace assimilation as a prerequisite for emancipation? And what did assimilation entail? Economic emancipation, the abandonment of anything too Jewish, and would that what would that be? What does it mean to be too Jewish? Is it just about religion or is it about a culture? Is it about an ethnic uh, identity? Now remember what assimilation means and entails. Assimilation means and implies to become part of another group or state so as to become identical to the majority group. Uh, group. It requires embracing sameness at the expense of any form of difference. Now, I want to look at two countries, Germany and France, to look at the situation of Jews there. Now, if we look at Germany, the rise of anti-Semitism was linked to the fate of nationalism. Remember that until the creation of the German Empire in 1871, there existed no national German state, no German nation, which meant that different states enacted different measures and dealt with their Jewish populations differently. As such, Jews were tolerated in a number of states where they often had to pay a uh, special taxation, that is a price 
uh, for every privilege granted to them. And in fact, um, this started slowly changing. There were two attempts in 1815 and 1848 and 49 to introduce uniform arrangements for Jews across all of these states, but these ended in failure. And in fact, from 1849 to 1871, the rapid economic development that Germany enjoyed under the guise of the Industrial Revolution, followed by the ascendancy of political liberalism, meant that the legal emancipation of Jews was on its way to be completed. So that full emancipation, that is the full granting of legal, political, and civic rights, was granted to Prussian Jews on July 3rd, 1869, and extended to the South in 1871. Now, what happened is that the Jewish community in Prussia was, and quickly became, a middle-class, wealthy, educated, secularized, and assimilated urban community. So this is very different than what we find in Eastern Europe. So in the late 19th century, as society had been changing and the country had undergone industrialization, rural elites found anti-Semitism to be a very effective political weapon to garner support from those who feared the consequences of Germany's sudden and overwhelming industrialization. Now, conservatives and the growing radical right, that is the far right, claim that Jews were responsible for the disruption of traditional society and charged them with being the sole beneficiaries of economic change. Remember that German Jews, uh, an urban middle-class, wealthy, educated, secularized, uh, uh, assimilated community made up only 1% of the German population. So there was a clear disjuncture between this charge and accusation that Jews had benefited from all these changes and represented the worst of these changes with the reality of Germ the German nation and the place of the Jewish community. So in the 1890s, Nationalist and anti-Semitic political pressure groups flourish, and they were spewing hate against Jews, but also the figure of the new women, social democrats, and they charge all of these categories to be internationalist, that is the opposite of nationalist, socially destructive and unpatriotic. Now, this was an especially powerful political weapon um, because it provided focus and it provided a way to put a face on what these people identified as the evils of modernity. Now, this new form of anti-Semitism that emerges that, and I'll talk about this in a minute, did not target um, the kinds of Jewish communities that one would find in the pile of settlement. In fact, this new form of anti-Semitism had as its principal target emancipated and assimilation Jews. And here is where the pseudoscientific theory of race becomes more important than religion. The Jewish question, which is how these people referred to this um, new anti-Semitism, could be defined as a question of race rather than religion. Remember the context of social Darwinism, the racial thinking of empire, but also the emerging popularity of eugenics that you will read about in your textbook. So anti-Semitism transformed from a Christian-inspired anti-Jewish doctrine and program into a philosophical and historical worldview that was rooted in racist theories and that provided a key to understanding and providing a solution to social and political problems. And this phenomenon is especially striking in the two decades that lead up to World War I, when anti-Semitism becomes a political movement. In fact, there are parties that emerge that are called the anti-Semitic party, and that is their sole platform.
So throughout Western Europe, in both republics and monarchies, anti-Semitism and nationalism played key roles in mass politics by providing a focus for the creation of a far right increasingly committed to combating the left and social democracy. Now, what was the situation in France? Was it different? In what ways was it different? What made France a unique case? Now, in France, the French Revolution had been an important turning point in the history of French Jewry. In fact, the events of 1789 led to a radical definition of the relationship of citizen community. Um, the Declaration of Rights of Man had said no one can be persecuted for their religious beliefs and opinions. But the, in the wake of the French revolutions, there was an effort to tackle the question of religious minorities, such as Protestants and Jews, who did not have the same political and civil rights as uh, French Christians. So in a historic decision, France was the first European nation to grant immediate and full emancipation to its Jewish citizens in 1791. Now, if the formal declaration happened swiftly, its substance was slower to come. Nonetheless, by the end of the 19th century, French Jews were thoroughly assimilated and in fact, as a community believed in assimilation as a process, they had confidence in the Third Republic and they were devoted to the French nation. So much so that in 1889, upon the centenary of the French Revolution, one rabbi declared, we have adopted the customs and traditions of a country which has so generously adopted us. And today, thanks to this, there are no longer but any Frenchmen in France. So for the French Jewish community, there was no distinction and no conflict between being French and Jewish both identities coexisted seamlessly. Now, again, it's important to look at the reality of the French Jewish community. At the time, uh, this was, again, a very small portion of the French population. There were only 68,000 Jews in France, and they had also become a visible portion of the French middle class. In fact, 60% of French Jews were concentrated in urban areas, in Paris in, and in four provincial cities, Marseille, Bordeaux, Nancy, and Lyon. The 1872 census of the Parisian Jewish community, which was the largest in France, revealed that only 10% of Parisian Jews were engaged in unskilled labor, in contrast to the more general urban masses. French Jews were not working class, even though some were work skilled artisans. They were mostly middle class. Now, they could be found in, the, in a number of professional and economic areas. In finance, the long standing legacy of having been restricted a profession of money lenders in the Middle Ages. But because the French state had fully emancipated its Jewish community, French Jews could be found in all areas of government and the state, a unique situation compared to the rest of Western Europe, where because emancipation didn't happen until the 19th century, political office or education were not open to Jews in the same way. They were found in academic institutions, um, in the spaces of knowledge, in universities. They were making careers in state service at the highest level as civil servants, magistrates, army officers, and elected officials. This is why the Dreyfus Affair matters. In fact, it focuses the story um, on a man who was rather typical of those Jewish, uh, French Jewish men who had climbed the ladder to success um, in a time when that was not possible in the rest of European countries. During the July monarchy, Jews served as French officers in the army. During the Third Republic, there were 25 French Jewish uh, generals, and they were also in the Chamber of Deputies and the Senate. So what we find 
is that at the same time that these individuals were high ranking civil servants or in the army or the state, despite the fact that their Jewishness was noted in their fields, they did not necessarily find uh, significant obstacles to their professional uh, success. And because this was so successful, we do not see what becomes apparent in other countries. So French, the, in the French Jewish communities, individuals did not necessarily change what would be deemed a recognizably Jewish name. They did not necessarily intermarry and they did not distance themselves from the organized Jewish community. This was a seamless web of French culture and Jewish identity. Yet, anti-Jewish prejudice had not dissipated. And anti-Semitism was also a vibrant force in France. In fact, the Dreyfus affair saw the resurgence of anti-Semitism so violent that it was more violent than anything found in Germany. Now, before the establishment of the Third Republic in 1871, there was a traditional form of anti-Semitism that is predominantly Catholic, with French newspapers regularly identifying Jewish defendants in court case, while refraining from mentioning the religious affiliations of others. There was also strong anti-Semitism amongst left wings and socialists because of the misguided association of Jews with capitalism. But overall, anti-Semitism rarely led to violence. We did not see pogroms the way that existed in Eastern Europe. Now, what we call modern political anti-Semitism, that is racial anti-Semitism, emerged in France during the last two decades of the 19th century. And interestingly, it is the Dreyfus affair that gave it new energy. Now, again, what was the context to the Dreyfus effect? Remember, the rise of anti-Semitism was linked to the fate of nationalism. So the context of the Franco-Prussian War of 1871, which led to the birth of the Third Republic, was crucial. This is when France loses its territories of Alsace and Lorraine on the border with Germany. And this is significant because uh, the Jews of Alsace and Lorraine had opted for French citizen, uh, citizenship and moved to the interior of the country. Then there were a series of scandals in the 1880s. In 1882, there was the spectacular collapse of a Catholic banking house. And this catalyzed modern anti-Semitism because those who saw this disaster suddenly blamed Jews for this particular um, collapse. And the scandal played out in the press. So it's important to think of the role of media, the printed press, as circulating these ideas, as well as prejudice all throughout the nation. This is essentially the printed press, the newspaper is the social media of the 19th century. 10 years later, in 1892, another scandal, the bankruptcy of the Pan Panama Canal Company. And here, because, because two Jewish financiers were involved, Jacques Reinhardt and Cornelius Hertz. Again, people blamed this scandal in, on to Jews. And this came in the wake of the renewal of French anti-Semitism, notably the publication in 1886 of um, a remarkably um, virulent and a nauseating anti-Semitic pamphlet of a thousand pages by Edouard Drummond called La France Juive, Jewish France, and it sold 100,000 copies and was a bestseller. So all of these ideas were relayed through the press. This is the age when we see the mass circulation of newspapers. They were cheap and therefore could be bought by a larger number of people. They were read by hundreds and thousands and distributed through France through the newly built railway network. And the great majority of these newspapers, even if they weren't outright anti-Semitic, carried out and carried with them anti-Jewish prejudice. So the Dreyfus Affair essentially becomes, when it erupts, the most notorious instance of um, 
modern political anti-Semitism in mass politics. Um, now, this takes place within the context of the, third, the creation of the Third Republic. Remember that after the de defeat in the Franco-Prussian War, the Third Republic was um, born and it was nonetheless still institutional fragile because this came in the wake of the brutal repression of um, the Paris Commune. Now, the Third Republic was backed by a, a political alliance of businessmen, shopkeepers, professionals, and rural and property owners. Um, and it was beset by a number of political scandals in the midst of economic downturns, attempted coups by the populist far-right leader, um, General Boulanger, um, but also the fact that every time these happened, the press attributed these scandals or these coups to Jews. They became essentially the scapegoat for understanding um, what had happened. Now, this was especially the case from those who are Catholic or dreamt of a return of the monarchy and who started believing in the fact that the Republic they imagined was backed by a conspiracy of Jews. Um, this was made even more real for these Catholic when the Third Republic decided in, in 1905 to separate church and state and to make the state a secular one. So let's look at the Dreyfus Affair, which your textbook talks about. What was it and why is it a complicated story? Well, it begins in 1893 with suspicions of treason. Um, what we have here is someone finding out a document that seems to suggest that a French, high-ranking French army officer has been giving information to the Prussian army. Remember, in the wake of the Franco-Prussian defeat, this is incredibly shocking. So this suspicion doesn't fall onto who it should be. The investigation is botched. And in fact, suspicions immediately fall onto Captain Alfred Dreyfus, who, of course, was a high ranking Jewish officer. And here we could see how anti Jewish sentiments and anti Semitism shaped what people assume would happen. He was court martial in December and then had to suffer the iniquity of um, a degradation. He is stripped off of his braids and buttons and his sword is broken. And for someone who is a proud military man, this has to be the worst. You can see it in his police photo after the conviction, the buttons and epaulets have been re removed from his uniform. And he is then sent to the penal colony of French Guiana. That is a, a very brutal um, prison situated very far in New Guyana, where all of those who had participated in the commune had been arrested and sentenced were being sent. This was the most brutal form of petition. Now, this scandal would have stayed as such had it not been for the fact that those who, is, who believed in Dreyfus's innocence, that is his family who started rallying people, started campaigning for uh, his innocence. And this will last for the next years. There is a petition in 1896 and a further campaign that takes on a different turn in 1897, when the very popular novelist, Emile Zola, publishes in the newspaper L'Aurore, J'accuse, I accuse, a plea defending Dreyfus. This is a turning point in the Dreyfus affair. This is essentially the moment in 1898 where Zola accuses the state at having conspired to ignore his innocence in the serving of protecting itself. Now he says there is a conspiracy at the heart of the state, but as you will read, the document sort of saves the president from such accusation. And with this campaign to defend Dreyfus, what takes place is a renewed anti-Semitic campaign with the worst kind of anti-Semitic um, 
uh, stereotypes being pedals. Now they weren't just visible in articles. There is a whole realm of visual anti-Semitic caricatures. Um, now, all of this was so divisive that people used to joke that you could not talk of the Dreyfus affair at a family dinner because then everyone, the pro-Dreyfus, the anti-Dreyfus, would fight and chaos would descend. But this is what also leads to the emergence of what we think of as the public intellectuals. Men like Emile Zola, who defend causes that are just morally and politically, and who will risk their reputation and use their reputation in the name of the right cause. Now, J'accuse was in fact the first open letter that Zola published there were more to come. And in, there were at the same time anti-Semitic riots that took place in Algeria. So this really defined not just France, but also its French and empire. A new trial was uh, put together in 1899 where uh, Dreyfus was found guilty. And in fact, what is um, the most devastating is that when Dreyfus was finally cleared, he was not so much declared innocent as amnestied and released. And this would not take place until 1906. In the meantime, the Dreyfus affair convinced everyone that the promise of emancipation for Jews was an empty one that France, the first nation that had granted its Jewish communities full emancipation, was also the place that had seen the worst of anti-Semitism in the late 19th century. And men like Theodore Herzl became convinced that there was no future for European Jews in, um, for the century to come. And that only the creation of a Jewish nation that is an, embedded in the philosophy of Zionism would be the ways in which Jews could save themselves from this virulent, violent, and deadly anti-Semitism. <laughs>